Uh, let's go ahead and get started. I hate mics that aren't mobile, but uh, we'll we'll try to work with it. I'm like, can't go very far. No. There we go. Okay. Well, well, we'll see if I need to carry it. I I like to be mobile. I like bouncing around and flailing my arms like a crazy man. Let's see if that works. That's working good. So great. Uh, thanks for everyone coming to my talk. IoT security, execute an effective security test process. A little bit about me, my name is uh, Daryl Hyland. I am the research lead for IoT technology at Rapid7. So what does that mean? Uh, you know, I wish it meant I got to play with IoT every day, all day, five days a week, but that's not the case. There's a lot of other things I have to do. But generally, the focus is around IoT, driving that knowledge factor within Rapid7 and helping our uh, global service pen test teams uh, develop methods, methodologies, and approaches around how do we uh, approach IoT for our customers to properly uh, secure the products when they come to us and point those issues out. So uh, today's agenda, we're going to talk about, obviously, uh, IoT ecosystem. Some of you have probably heard me mention this ecosystem, but we're going to go through it again. I think it's very important to get our mind around how we're going to approach IoT technology. We're going to talk about IoT testing methodologies. This is kind of like, you know, as we start working on IoT and testing IoT, it becomes real apparent, you know. These are the areas we typically want to look at, and this is how we want to generally look at those areas. And then also some IoT research results. So as we break down the different methodology structures, uh, I'm going to throw different uh, research I did in there, whether it's findings, vulnerabilities. We have a couple couple new vulnerabilities. I don't consider them like really, really great, but I think they're uh, critical uh, that actually were released. It uh, should have been published like an hour or two ago, uh, dealing with one of the products. Uh, and then we're going to talk about you know some of the things I've done when I'm actually testing IoT, some of the things I learned in the process, and hopefully you guys will get some ideas out of it. Uh, also, feel free to give me ideas, you know, in some of these subject matters. So I'll be here until Sunday around noon. So please engage me. I love talking about this stuff, and I love learning new stuff. You know, there's every, every time I open up a new piece of technology, I learn new stuff. I develop new methods, or I find someone else has already done it, and I learn from them. So hopefully we'll share some of that with you. And, of course, questions. Don't hesitate to ask me some questions. Um, I, th I think we got plenty of time to do that, so please do. So let's start off on IoT ecosystem. So how does this work? So when I first took the role at Rapid7 as the research lead, I was asked, okay, Daryl, now that you're in charge of like IoT, what the hell's IoT? Okay. And I think we're all right like, still answering that. And there is no solid answer to what IoT is. It's it's becoming the norm not the abnorm, okay? So in the IoT ecosystem, I kind of put together a model, and this model is not meant to define all IoT, but it's meant to define the structure of IoT and how we look at IoT when we get around to testing it mostly. And it's generally made up of these three critical parts, uh, or four critical parts, mobile, cloud, hardware, and the network communication in between these. So why are we looking at it like this? Well, so many of us, think about IoT, we think about hardware hacking. It's all about just the hardware. But the fact is, that's only one piece of the entire puzzle. And if we continue looking at just that hardware, we start siloing these different pieces. The mobile app becomes another silo. You know, the cloud APIs become another silo, and we don't look at them and how they interact with each other, looking at it from an ecosystem standpoint. Now this model, even though it fits very closely to consumer-grade products, it also fits other industries also. So the mobile may, you know, be human machine interfaces in an industrial environment. They control the devices. They're used for managing the devices. The cloud APIs in an industrial environment may be, uh, you know, the data historian systems. So it's still a similar model and it's how it works. And by looking at this whole model here and approaching testing in this particular model, we can get an understanding of those interactions and the impact of that. Because typically, you know, if I have a piece of hardware and it's fairly secure and the only way to really hack it is like cut the box open and pull the chips off and there's no way to externally hack this device, which does happen, where are we left? We say, okay, your IoT is secure. No, it's not. When we turn around and look at the mobile apps or the cloud APIs and find out that these are 
riddled with vulnerabilities. Now I can take a mobile app, connect to the cloud APIs, and control your hardware by violating all the security in these other pieces. So we need to look at that. And then also the network communication. This includes, you know, standard Ethernet, Wi-Fi, but it also includes the other protocols, the RF protocols, and how they interact with the subcomponents in the ecosystem. So the ultimate goal when we approach IoT is that ecosystem of that product. All the pieces, parts, code, applications, servers that make that technology do what it's meant to do should be what we're looking at when we're testing IoT. Does that make sense to everyone? Hopefully it does. So what are we going to get out of that? Obviously, it's going to help us define the overall exposure footprint. By looking at all the pieces and how they interact, we can better threat model it for risk. Often we do that kind of threat modeling, you know, when I put a system together and start looking at it, I stand back and go, okay, what kind of evil shit can I do to this? And I start modeling that out. How do I approach this? What do I want to do? So we build these threat models on how to approach testing or attacking the particular devices. And of course we can determine the impact. What's the impact of the overall ecosystem if there's cloud issues, cloud API issues? What about if there's issues with the iOS or Android applications? So all those are actually considered, and again, looking at the whole ecosystem, we can better conduct a thorough security test or a more thorough security test. So coming out of that, what we want to do and what we've done is looked at IoT testing methodologies. Now, in generally, this is fairly high level uh, because every granular level you get to is really dependent on the particular device or ecosystem you're looking at, so it can vary. And it's typically made up of these eight general categories, functional evaluation of the product, device reconnaissance. I mean, we often forget, what about recon work? What can we find out about the device? Cloud web APIs, mobile control applications, network communication, physical device inspection. Not physical device hacking, inspection. And then get into physical device attacks, firmware, JTAG, UART, all those type of things. And then, of course, a lot of these devices utilize various radio RFs, whether it's Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, Lutron. You know, list goes on and on and on of the different protocols. So we want to approach every one of these and combine them all into an holistic approach when we're looking at this. So the first one is functional evaluation. In a functional evaluation, we want to look at a standard deployment. If you go to look at an IoT technology and you look outside, at it outside its environment completely, you really can't do an effective test on it. So it actually a, needs to be deployed in its normal functioning environment. I always set up two environments. So anytime I purchase a product for doing research on or I deal with a customer, it's all about two environments. So why two environments? Well, one, I want to make sure it stays running normal like it's supposed to. And the other one, we beat the crap out of it with hammers and saws and whatever else we're going to do to. And then use that data to connect over to the other one. Also, it comes in handy when you're looking at cloud APIs, especially when you're doing research. Uh, often when you're doing research, you do not have full access to do testing against cloud APIs unless you like, you know, uh, stripe suits and, and, and bars. Uh, it becomes illegal, if not unethical at best. So often with two environments, it gives us a little more insight into the cloud APIs because now I'm not ta attacking some poor innocent soul out there as I'm trying to test the APIs. I can look at how I can attack myself. So I can use data from one to see if I can attack another. I can use authentication of this guy to see if I can get access to this guy's data. So it gives me a, a big sweeping access to test various API functionalities without violating any kind of laws. And of course, map. Mapping out the entire infrastructure. This is critical. So during this actual functional evaluation, you want to look at the features, functions, components, and communication paths, and literally document all of them. This is before you do any attacks. You want to know the environment. You want to know how it communicates, who it communicates to, where it communicates, uh, because that's kind of interesting. I've fired up devices and, and in this evaluation process go, oh, interesting. It's calling China. Why is it calling China? What kind of data is being exchanged? So you want to be able to do that. Completely map this out. Uh, so functional evaluation is, this is my lab. This is my house. My home is my lab. I bring technology and I deploy it in my environment, my home. I actually use it. So some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, some of the vulnerabilities. During the research, I deployed two systems. 
one of the systems still running the lights in my house, and I can control it with my phone from here, which probably would be too smart in this crowd, but... <laughs> so, and again, two installations, and use the product to its full capacity. So when you do an evaluation of a product, testing of a product, an IoT's ecosystem, you really want to see how it works. So you want to spend some time using it, get familiar with it, become part of it. it makes attacking it way much easier when you really understand why it's there, how it works. Moving from there, device recon. Now this is a big area that's often overlooked, and there's a number of things to think about this. You don't want to look at component versions on the products. You know, whether it's the firmware versions, you know, how many versions are out there, all that type of stuff. We will look at software versions with, uh, you know, how, how uh, you know, the mobile applications, software versions are out there, which one's predominant. Even your Android operating system versions need to be taken into consideration during this process. Vulnerability history. Just because you think this product's been patched or, or, or no one's found vulnerabilities on it, that may not be true. It's not uncommon to find out that a vulnerability has been discovered and the vendors never actually patched that. So, and I consider refinding vulnerabilities from a historical past important, as long as you always make reference back to the original finder. And then you also want to take that to the vendor and go, look, you didn't fix it two years ago. Why aren't you fixing it now? Type things. And then open source, what's used when open source? Or are there, you know, part of the uh, firmware open source? You know, is, is the hardware open source? I did uh, some work on a device. When we tore it all apart, we found out that its guts was nothing but a beagle bone. Okay, so, and then white label products. This is really bad. Vendors are white labeling everything out there. So you buy a product, you think it's from company A, and it turns out that same product's used by dozens, if not hundreds, of different companies with different labels on it. Somebody over here has attacked a product and found all kinds of vulnerabilities on it. That doesn't mean this product that's white labeled doesn't have those. It's high probability it does, and that needs to be considered when looking at these. User manuals. I love user manuals. Some of the coolest hacking I've done was by spending time looking at the user manuals. I remember working in a company, someone said, Daryl, we dare you to try to break into our uh, um, critical systems that are used for billing. I'm like, okay. I downloaded the manuals. <laughs> I was into a system in 30 minutes, and it's the same way here. Understanding the manuals may obviously point out design flaws and vulnerabilities, backdoor information, all kinds of stuff. Spend time in those manuals. And we have an example there. Uh, component data sheets. Going out, when you open up the device eventually, you want to look at the data sheets. Track out all the chips that you can identify, what they do, what their purpose is. You're going to encounter new devices being used. You want to understand those. Uh, and then FCC data. How many people are familiar with going out to FCC? Okay. That's kind of, kind of key. We want to be able to do that. And we've got a slide for that also. So moving from there in the device recon, obviously, FCC. So you, you can go to the back of a device and you can find an FCC ID on the back of the device. You go out to FCC, you can enter this in there, and you will get the data on the device. This device had to go through testing. They had to submit it to the FCC. This will often contain breakdowns of the device taken apart. So before I ever pull any screws, nuts, bolts, or take a hacksaw to any device, I literally will go to the FCC, pull down the diagrams, and take a look at it. How is it constructed? If I'm taking a, you know, a Dremel tool to the device, the last thing I do want to do is when I'm done cutting it open, find out I slice one of the chips in half. This is how you prevent that. You get a breakdown of the device on the inside for the most part. FCC test reports. These will lay out the frequencies and a lot of critical information if you're looking at tacking the RF area of a device. Okay, this was cool. So there's a whole backstory on this. This happens to be a panic button. So uh, early this year, late last year, I was contacted by the Associated Press. And they goes, you know what? These panic buttons are actually being recommended by the Colombian government to protect dissidents from being kidnapped. And we're really curious since, you know, our AP people are actually using these devices, what is the security risk? So we brought the device in. I did everything to it. I looked at the entire ecosystem. 
But one thing I looked at, and there was a number of vulnerabilities between this and the cloud API functionality, but the one I want to point out is the service manual. So I open up, the, the way this device works is you press the button, you can set up three phone numbers in it. You press the button, it'll dial these phone numbers in sequence, and it'll also send text messages out if you want to. This is actually configured over SMS. Okay, and you can set a password on it or pass string. It's like six characters, so you can lock this. So once it's locked, anyone sending a um, message, SMS message, will not get anything back. Okay, without that, you can actually send a text message with a command, and it'll respond back with data like GPS coordinates. And there's all kinds of crazy things you can do in this. So we open up the manual and we start looking at it, and we see under the pin lock. One, two, three, four, you can set a pin lock. And this applies except for reboot and reset. Okay. <laughs> reboot, that's not true. The reboot actually needs a password. The reset does not. So what does reset do? It actually sets this son of a bitch back to factory default. <laughs> so if the Colombian drug cartel happens to have your phone number, what they do is they send you an SMS message that says reset. At that point, it is a brick for the most part. They press the button, it's not going to call anyone. To make matters worse, this thing's so functionally advanced, they can then send messages and get your GPS coordinates. They can also send a message to reconfigure this thing to turn the lights, alarms off, and turn it into a listening device remotely. So. And on top of that, when we got into the hardware, just to cover it, I was looking for a, a, a way. If I could, not, if I did not know what the phone number was, but I know the phone number ranges, how would I identify a device out there if the actual password was set on it? Because there's no response back. Pulled the firmware, dumped the firmware, and we found an undocumented command in there. It was very similar. It, it was reboot, but it was all uppercase with the exclamation point after it. It didn't actually work, but what it would do is respond back with an error message, identifying that it was one of these devices. So then you could basically SMS dial them, war dial them, identify all the devices that have that. At that point, you could literally just shut them all off, start GPS tracking in and listening to the people, which uh, I don't know about you, me, but uh, if I was in a country trying to protect myself, that's the last thing I would want to use. But uh, for all due respect to the vendor that produced these, their statement was this was not meant to protect people from being kidnapped by Colombian drug lords. It was meant for something you give to your grandmother in case she wanders off, in case she falls down, or something like that, which from a risk factor, the risk greatly is reduced at that point. But using one of these devices to protect yourself from being kidnapped by anybody would be the biggest mistake because they reset it and then they can find out where you're at and come and get you. So, so moving from there, moving into the mobile applications and control systems. Again, some of the things you want to look for when I'm looking at the mobile application, and, and of course, this changes based on what the app does. But in general, you want some general checks. You know, is encryption there? Is it storing data unencrypted? What about encrypted transfer? Authentication processes, are they solid, secure? Access rights, uh, does the mobile application, you know, prompt you and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm here to play a game, but yet I want to know all your address books and dialing systems and personal data, you know what I mean? It asks too much rights. Those are a risk, and you need to understand those, and that's part of testing or evaluating a product. Uh, communication protocols and SSL pinning. Uh, SSL pinning is like really freaking rare. <laughs> it seems like IoT mobile applications. Just recently we did an assessment and it was the first one I've ever seen where they actually implemented SSL pinning. I was like, wow, this is cool. Of course we violated it, but that's beside <laughs> the point. <laughs> still had to make some effort to do that, but, uh, but still SSL pinning was in place. So that was kind of cool and I'd like to see that. And I pushed back to vendors, start SSL pinning. That'll prevent people from more easily man in the middle of your data communications and affected it. So, oh yeah, before we get to the next slide. So how many people here have a Wink, Wink 2 in their home? Only one? Sorry, it's actually in my suitcase right now. Okay, well that doesn't really count. <laughs> I can't believe people here don't have a Wink. How many people here actually have IoT in their house? Okay, well I'm a little, a little more comfortable now. I'm starting to worry about it there. It's like technology people with no technology. Hughes. Hughes. 
I have a look to those. So looking at the mobile application for the Wink 2, and this is what we put out, uh, and this is not an uncommon problem. Even though Android and iOS have built in functionality to actually encrypt data in storage, especially this type of key data, passwords, all that stuff, in this case they did not. And here we have the OAuth token. This OAuth token is always, always valid as long as you're logged into the device. How many people log out of their devices on all their IoT apps? Nobody. It defeats the whole purpose of having IoT if you've got to log in every time to turn your lights on in your house. So as you see, we have this actually stored in clear text on the device. So if someone gets that, they can control your environment. Uh, this is going to get much worse here in a minute. But we're going to move over here to uh, uh, Insteon, Smart Hubs. Anyone have an Insteon in their house? I heard a laugh back there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Same thing. Uh, we have passwords, clear text. There's my password if everyone wants it. Get out there and log in. Of course, that particular device is like in multiple pieces now, so I don't know do you much good. And I think I changed the password also. Uh, and we also, hardware has passwords. Cool thing with the hardware here, it has... It has a fixed password and a fixed username, and they're always different on every product. So that's kind of cool. It was the first company I've seen doing it, and I liked it. Uh, but they're actually storing it on your phone uh, in clear text, which could or could not be a problem based on how good you are at keeping your phone or losing it, and whether you use iOS or some kind of encryption and all that type of stuff. So moving from there, we get into the cloud and web APIs. Uh, again, encryption, storage, transfer, these things to be considered. Authentication, session management. Remember, a session management, we just talked about the OAuth, we're going to dig into this a little deeper. Uh, common web vulnerabilities, cross-site scripting, cross-site, the list goes on and on and on. We know about web vulnerabilities. And when you're doing evaluation or testing, when you can legally have access to do those, test for all of those. You're going to find them. Probably seven out of ten times when I'm testing an IoT technology, I find problems in the APIs, almost always. Some of them quite critical. This particular device, I don't have pictures of it, but it has what's known as real-time tracking. So this phone takes a, a, a card and it communicates over port 7050 to your cloud API and it'll track your data so you can go online and look at that. If you have an account on that system, you can look at everyone's data on the face of the earth, okay? Uh, you can actually configure their devices through the APIs to the device also. And the list goes on and on of failures. Uh, the communication from this device to the cloud APIs is not encrypted. No authentication to pass the data. All it does is pass the ESN9 number. I get that all shit mixed up, but uh, the, the identifier for your phone. And uh, so, so I actually, as a test, was able to send data to a device that I had control of and actually make the device jump from Dayton, Ohio to uh, Russia <laughs> and poison the data. So there's always API issues out there. And also, last time I checked, none of their APIs have been fixed. Um, so moving back to the Wink 2, uh, it turns out there's a couple things to point out. So when you log off from the application, the mobile application, you think you're logging off. It's going to send a log off out to the cloud API saying, I've logged off. No, the only thing it does is it passes this X device identifier out there and basically says delete it. That is not used for absolutely anything that I could identify. It does not log you out. So when you log out, you do not log out. On top of that, it turns out the OAuth token when you log out is not flushed. So it's not revoked. The OAuth token appears to stay valid for 30 days. So if you lose your phone, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to go in and you're going to change the password on your account. And you would expect that to revoke all tokens associated with your account. The answer to that is no. In this case, it does not revoke none of the tokens. Any token assigned appears to stay valid for at least 30 days or as long as it's continually used. So if, as far as I know, this the, the vendor's fixing these issues, um, and they should have. The other one's been fixed that I know of dealing with the Wink 2, and I'm pretty sure this one's been fixed also. But, I mean, think of the ramifications of that. I mean, people lose their phones all the time. Most of the time when you lose your phone, the people just want to steal your phone. 
uh, unless somebody in this room finds it. <laughs> <laughs> then the whole model changes. At that point, you may go, hey, what can I get off this? And hopefully you're ethical enough not to do that. But you have the knowledge and the capability to do that. Once you have that OAuth token, which is set in on the phone, and you continue to use it, this poor soul can never not have you have full control of everything in their house. The Wink2 device is, uh, is not a standalone product with its own sub-products. It is a, a basically an integration platform. So it has all the protocols, uh, Zigbee, Z-Wave, all of them, and it integrates with every, not every product, but most of the products out there. So literally, I have uh, the Wink 2, and I have like Insteon light bulbs connected to it. I have Osram light bulbs connected to it. I have an Amazon Echo attached to it. So you can attach all these different products. So it's meant to manage your entire home environment. Yes, sir? So your only option at that point would be Set it Remove your account and create a new one, yes. That's the only way. So if you have this product, and, you, and I'm assuming this has all been fixed, I'm pretty sure it has, uh, but in that case there, if you had lost it, the most appropriate thing would be to, again, flush your accounts, disassociate all your devices, reset them all, and rebuild your entire house environment. That's the only way to be ensure that you're not going to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and your lights are going to be going on and off and your TV coming on and off and who knows, your Amazon Echo talking to you, who knows. Sky's the limit. Any questions? Okay, so then we get into the network environment. Again, you know, we talked about exposed services on the network. You want to look at those. Authentication, access rights, encryption, Intra-product ecosystem communication. So you have all these sensors and devices. You want to be able to track and trap all that type of data and look at it and evaluate it for security issues. So this particular one, uh, which I thought was an absolute perfect example. Anytime you're looking at a home automation IoT technology and you test it, there's one thing you always need to test for. What is fail state on the device? When I mean fail state, what happens if the internet goes down? Can you no longer open your garage door? Can you no longer turn your lights on and off? Because if that's the case, you probably bought the wrong product. Most of the time, those products will go to local mode. Local mode means the devices are going to start communicating local to the particular device. On these particular technologies, when I killed it, my cell phone and everything switched over and started communicating over port 4000 to the device, unencrypted, unauthenticated. And so what I did here, this is just an example of a, uh, a snippet from a block of data from the Perl script uh, that I wrote where I decoded all the data and I wrote a quick Perl script so I could take this home automation system and when it went into local, or whether it was in local mode or not, that port was always up and running. Just didn't know what it was used for until it went into local mode and I was able to capture all that communications. So at that point, I captured all the communications ran the product through all of its functionalities, trapped everything, decoded all the packages, and found out that I could turn around and write a program where I can send the packet to the device and tell it to jump from a person's Wi-Fi to a Wi-Fi I control. Um, so, and that's what this packet actually does. It switches the SSID and the pre-share keys to move it over to another device. So literally, if somebody had access to your network where this was running, they could literally move the controls of the device to something that you can man in the middle or control yourself. Uh, also, key to remember, you know, these devices and how they communicate or capture firmware or receive firmware varies in different ways. Sometimes firmware will come down to your cell phone and be deployed out that way. Sometimes it'll actually the device will call out to the internet. This particular device would call out to the internet to China to get its firmware upgrades. But you had to tell it to from the mobile application, but the mobile application never received the data. So you're able to capture it with Wireshark. It was unencrypted in transfer. The only saving grace was the uh, firmware was actually encrypted. So, the, so they did one thing good. But if you've never used Wireshark to uh, strip out packets under file export object HTTP, uh, when you capture all that communications, it'll actually just dump the binary out for you. And you just get the binary that way. So if you're thinking, oh, how do I get the firmware? I can't get in between the device properly or, you know, this is the way to do it. If you can and it's unencrypted, you can actually get the firmware this way. And sometimes it's way much easier than cutting the device open and pulling chips and crazy things like that. But uh, 
uh, cutting things open and pulling chips is way much funner, you know, in my opinion. But <laughs> it's not always the practical approach, uh, especially if it's a paid engagement that's time consuming. Now, often when I'm doing research in my lab and I can get the firmware this way, if I open up the device and I see something I hadn't seen recently, I'll take the firmware off the device just to refresh my mind and process on how to do it, or if some other, I've never done it before, on a new chip. So I get a new chip, it has onboard flash on the actual CPU, and I can get the firmware this way. If it's not a paid engagement, it's research, I'll pull the firmware off the device directly just to get that knowledge, to build that knowledge level. Because sooner or later, I'm gonna be in a case with that same chip environment where I can't get it this way. Physical embedded hardware inspection. In my opinion, when you, when you get ready to get to this phase here, take your time. Open the device up and just spend some time looking at it. Record all the chips, write them all down. Go to the data sheets, review the data sheets. Look at, the, look at how, how the thing works. You know, sometimes you can trace out some of the runs on the device and see what chips are talking to what chips and kind of gather that data because it comes, it comes in really critical. And we have, we'll have an example here later where I was able to do this uh, and, uh, and add some value by understanding the inter-component communication where I could. Obviously, some of these devices are multi-layered. It's not easy to identify, but where you can identify, identify all the piece, parses, and the communication. And I often spend a number of hours just looking at the device, looking at it under a microscope, looking at the leads, looking at the runs. How's it all put together? How's it all work? You want to look at the chip, CPU, mini, communication, physical ports, Ethernet, USB, serial, UART, JTAG, SPI. The cool thing is there's still a lot of vendors out there that are nice enough to tag everything on the board for you. I always like that. You know, It's like, yeah, thank you. That's the UART. That, you just saved me some time. There's a header there for me and everything. You're nice. That isn't always the case. But kind of mapping out the board is key. Moving from there, get into the physical device attacks. Again, this is, this is kind of fun, you know, looking at the JTAGs, if they're working, the UARTs, you know, the serial program interfaces, memory extraction. I love extracting firmware from devices. It's a challenge. It's like, here's a device. How do we get the data off this device? It's totally cool. Have it, how many people here have actually done that? Okay, cool. The ones that haven't, you got to do it. It's like fun as hell. Okay, so tomorrow I'm going to be in the IoT Village, and we're going to be doing some demos. Uh, some of the stuff we're going to slow show here, we're actually going to do again uh, there. Where we're actually going, if, if it works out, we're actually going to pull like uh, embedded multimedia control chips off a uh, Amazon Echo and actually pull the data off of it, so we can actually look at the firmware. Uh, and if it goes right, it's an example we have here is on another device. But once you see it, you'd be like, "Damn, that's easy." So, uh, just in this area, I want to just show about some of the examples of pulling actual data off chips and pulling chips. This happened to be a Wink 2, uh, and this was an interesting situation. So I had the Wink 2, and there used to be a TSOP 48 pin NAND chip right there. There's no longer there. So I pulled the TSOP. I pulled the firmware off the device for further evaluation, which has been its own little headache uh, off the side. And then you're stuck with this board. Now this board no longer works. If other people that do this type of work are like me, I don't like breaking nothing. So my ultimate goal is let's put it back in service. So then I start thinking, if, you know, if I solder that chip back on there, which is fairly easy, this, this right here, the chip's only about the size of a penny, okay? From here to here is about the width of a penny. So the chips are pretty small. It's a 0 0.5 millimeter pitch on these chips, but it's really easy to solder. It's amazingly easy. Go out to Google. There's some uh, demonstrations of what's called drag soldering. Once you see that done, because I was like, okay, how do I put this on? Go out to Google. This was a while back. Go, okay. I'm like, holy mackerel. And the first time I did it on another board, it worked first time. And I'm like, this is so easy. So look up drag soldering. Makes it so simpler. But in this case here, I was like, well, what happens when they come out with a firmware two weeks from now? Am I have to pull the chip off again? So I went out on the internet, start searching, and I found on eBay a chip socket for a TSOP 48. And uh, I turned around and I soldered that on the board. 
So now I just open the lid, pull the chip out, and I got the latest, greatest firmware off the device. And it works. The whole thing works. You power it up and it runs. Putting this socket on was like amazing pain in the ass, okay? <laughs> okay, because most of the, uh, most of the uh, surface mount device chips have what's gall wings. So the leads kind of stick out the side so you can drag solder. This one had pins that stuck straight down. And they were up underneath the lower edge. So we had it tilted at an angle under a microscope, and I was able to drag solder and get it to work. Uh, but there was a couple solder bridges that I had to clean up. So it took me two or three tries and about 15 minutes to actually get this actually on there. And of course, then you're like, you put the chip in, you cross your fingers, and you plug it in your way. You're like, it, 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 is the smoke going to get out or not? You know, <laughs> you plug it in, and the Wink 2 came up running. I'm like, damn, I'm good. <laughs> of course, that's what you always tell yourself until the smoke gets out. So, which which does happen. Trust me, I've smoked a few items in my days. So, uh, moving from there, uh, another interesting way for gathering data, and this one I want to demo over there too, so you can actually see it. So, I'm looking at this device. This is the uh, Insteon, Insteon device, and I wanted to figure out how the whole thing was. Configured. This particular chip, MRF49XA, is actually three different frequencies. It's 915, 884, and 433, I believe. And uh, turned out that I wanted to understand how this chip was actually being configured in the circuitry. So it has a small PIC processor down here. It's a real simple single functionality PIC processor or minimal functionality PIC processor. So it turned out, mapping out the board and all the pieces and the data sheets, this connects to that over SPI. And when you power it up, it sends all the configuration data to the chip, configuring the data, configures the, the frequency, it configures the offset, because this is a uh, frequency shift keying device. So it gives you the offset from center frequency to one and what the zero is for the two uh, shift frequency. It gives you that hertz, kilohertz range. It gives you the... Uh, a whole list of different things. And it's kind of cool. So you just hook up a data analyzer to these key things here, and you turn the power on and you capture it. And then you take that data, and the output is this data right here. And you go to the actual data sheets, and it lists this stuff, every one of these, exactly like that. And you can map out every part of that chip. So anytime you get ready to do some RF analysis of a device, Consider looking at the chip and seeing if you can tap into any of the communications on the chip and how it's configured. Because that data you extract out of there plays a big role when you get around to actually doing the RF testing if you want to try to decode. Now, on this particular device with the Insteon, it turned out that Insteon puts out a standard document or a white paper on their entire protocol. Everything in that is wrong. <laughs> okay. The chip was not configured based on most of the stuff they said. Um, so they said it was like a 60, 60 K Hertz offset. It was 75 K Hertz offset. They said the center frequency was 915 and it's actually, in my case, is 915.6. Um, so, and it varies between devices. I, I guess you have some kind of changes or drift there. But, uh, Turns out I wasn't the only one. Recon. So remember the whole recon thing. So I come back to this phase here, and I go to decode all this stuff. And the data that I got off of it helped me get a little further in the decode. And I'm like, this shit doesn't make sense. What else is wrong? Well, I did a little recon. And we'll get back here in a second. Hold up. Wait a second. Oh, that's another. So we'll get back to this. But uh, it's another story. So, so we'll get back to that in a minute. So... Uh, Moving from there, uh, also, this was kind of an interesting one. I'm sorry I, my story kind of jumps around a little bit. But uh, firmware extraction. So I hadn't seen this. So every one of your cell phones has what's known as an embedded multimedia controller chip in it. Massive amount of storage, pretty amazing. And I hadn't seen these in IoT tech devices until recently. And I've come across a couple of them that opened up. I'm not going to say what this device is. Uh, because it doesn't really matter who the vendor is. It's about the multimedia controller chip. So I'm looking at this chip, and I'm doing a real, lot of research, and there's a lot of data out there in reference to uh, research on forensics on phones around this area. 
So as you see, it's a BGA chip. There are no leads on this thing. So got to get the chip off there, right? So yeah, so out comes the hot air system. So uh, hot air system was great for pulling this. The tape on here is actually heat protection tape. So I mapped out everything around it because I obviously don't want my hot air gun blowing caps and resistors off the board. So I tape everything down with the heat thing and it just takes me a few minutes and I can lift the chip off there. So I want to show that. So let's click over here. So they make these devices here. And as you can see, it's an actual SD card. And literally, you pull the chip out, you drop it in here, and you'll see. If it works. It's my, my only one demo. Let's see if it comes up. Just thinking about it. OK, there we go. Let's see if this works. So you literally put the chip in here. After you cleaned it up, you come down to your SD slot. You plug this in, and you mount up the entire office. Get out of the way. Man. Get the hell out of the way. <laughs> this is one why everyone was looking at me like I was stupid. So literally, literally you can get in here. It's an entire bedded operating system. So you know, we, can, we have access to everything including the shadow files, encrypted passwords, everything. So, so you know, to hell with Benwalk. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like totally cool. So when I, when I first figured this, uh, didn't figure it out, but when I went out and looked at other people's research around uh, discovering these and, and pulling data off these devices, I thought, this is cool. So I bought these, and there's like four of them. They're different sizes. That one's the smaller chip. It's 115 uh, BGA. This one's like a 221, and they go up. So the EMMCs, and e, which is a multimedia controller, embedded multimedia controller, there's EMCPs, which is embedded um, multi-chip packages, and those contain both the RAM and the flash. So it was kind of like cool uh, when I started doing this. It makes it so much easier. You know, there's nothing better than just having it mount up for you without even thinking about it. And it was like $95. So I was talking to one of my friends uh, earlier yesterday, and we started talking about the EMMCs. And I said, yeah, and I went out and bought this thing for $95. I dropped the chip in, I plug it in, it all mounts up. And he's like, what? What? I spent days building one of those. <laughs> I'm like, 95 bucks, man, Shanghai Suppress. Shipped it right to my house. It took two weeks. So let's go ahead and switch back over. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, for those of us that are interested in starting to dabble with some of these hardware aspects of what you're doing, do you have a device that you recommend that's like kind of a nice entry level, easy to grab firmware, easy to connect to, like the UARTs and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, the if you want to connect to like UARTs, I just uh, like the uh, uh, Shikra from Exhibitor. It has, I think it has JTAG, SPI. You can actually use it to pull firmware off SPI flash chips. Uh, you can hook up UART with it. It's what, 40 bucks? 45. 45 bucks, dirt cheap. Uh, I would go with that. Uh, I would recommend, like I have like a JTAGulator we can plug in and automatically kind of map out the UARTs and JTAGs. That's like 160 bucks, but I think from if you're just trying to map out uh, uh, UART, sometimes people like to do multimeters. I hate that process because I suck at it. Uh, so I just use in that case there uh, like a Sele, which is a logic analyzer. You can get a lower end logic analyzer. I think the cheapest one that makes like 105 bucks, and those will actually do decoding and stuff like that too. I meant the device that you're actually attacking, like a good entry level device that will allow you to do those things to it. Goodwill. Goodwill. Go to Goodwill. Go into Goodwill, buy, buy routers, modems, home stuff like that. I use those for training. The good thing with it, back then there was absolutely no ever have a risk of having security. Okay? <laughs> so all the JTAGs will work, all the UARTs will work, uh, the firmware will dump right out, and Benwalk will work on it every time. Perfect training platforms. Anything that's more than four, three, four, five years old. Uh, I actually did a bunch of training not too long ago showing people stuff, and I went out and bought uh, 
uh, oh gosh, what was it? Uh, the the Cisco uh, Wet 2000 or Wet 200, uh, which is a home-based um, contract thing. That vendor's name. Uh, Cisco bought them out and then got rid of them again. Linksys, Linksys yeah, Linksys. Uh, those Linksys Wet 200. You get them on eBay for like 25 bucks. Great training platform because all the stuff I'm showing you actually is there, uh, and it'll work. What's that? Their Wi-Fi, their Wi-Fi routers. The Wet 200 is a bridge device, uh, a bridge router. So this never did come back up. Well, that kind of sucks. Okay, so uh, so in radio radio RF stuff again encryption pairing access control example Bluetooth pairing uh, check pairing. There's a number of cheap individual devices you can do for testing that type of stuff. Uh, Hack RF is a great tool. It's three hundred some dollars, but I usually use that. Uh, check for access control, command and control, replay attacks. Replay attacks are so easy to do to quickly validate, you know, things related to encryption because if it's encrypted, replay attack shouldn't work. So you're going to check that out. Uh, looking at the Insteon, I, I'd mentioned the Insteon protocol earlier and said I had, uh, was able to get the chip data and try to decode it. Also vulnerable to replay attack. This was 915 megahertz, or yeah, 915 megahertz communication, uh, frequency shift keen. Uh, and they had no encryption. So literally, this is a capture of a garage door. I think it's a garage door or a light bulb. Uh, and I was actually able to just replay it. Do the right tuning. There's plenty of documentation out there. Do replay. It's vulnerable. This was reported before me. And I mentioned that all their standards document didn't actually map how the chip was actually configured. Well, there's some really cool work that had already been done. Uh, and I recommend looking at this work. Uh, Peter Shipley, DEF CON 23. I'm not going to go back and go through everything he did. Watch this presentation. It goes through a number of the things I was dealing with on the Insteon and some of the issues with that and the issues with their documentation versus actually how the device is configured and how the protocol works. Uh, it's actually amazing. It's really cool presentation. And he actually has tools for attacking the Insteon protocol and decoding it. So he has decoding tools that he's written out there. Uh, so I do recommend checking that out. It's kind of a lot of fun. So we're kind of spinning down. So, you know, why, why, you know, we come back to the whole thing. Why are we looking at IoT? Why are we putting a methodology into this? Why are we approaching that whole ecosystem? And the ultimate thing is, you know, we want to reduce risk. We want our products patched. We want them secure. Uh, we want a better products. And also, uh, the one of the things I drive for is I want a deeper understanding of the stuff I'm looking at. And that's where the whole research comes in. That's why, that's why when I'm looking at hardware and I got the firmware from the vendor, that I still go into the device and attack the device to get the firmware. Knowledge, building that knowledge on the various chips, how to get the data, how interchip communication works, how the RFs are configured, how the processes are configured, the different versions of flash chips, whether it's you know, a TSOP 48 or standard 8-pin flash chip or all the way to an EMMC uh, device. It's ultimately about building that knowledge level because then it plays into the next job that you do for evaluating the overall security of that ecosystem. So any questions before we conclude? Yes, sir. I've never actually done that. Uh, sure, why not? You can always call them in. Yeah. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. So yeah, I, I like violate warranties all the time, uh, but I don't uh, I don't expect them to fix the stuff. Okay. It was like I don't know what happened. It you know my Dremel tool just like cut it in half when I wasn't looking, <laughs> <laughs> and now it's not working. You know, I, I, I put the chip into the chip reader backwards and fed, you know, 3.3 .3 volts into the ground. I don't know why smoke came out of it. <laughs> I think you guys should fix it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, chip desoldered. I, I, 
Yeah, yeah, you can put the chips back on it if you and you practice enough times, you can get it to the point where they couldn't tell. Um, and that's why I mentioned the drag solder because the first time I did drag solder, I looked at it and compared to other chips on the board. And I'm like, damn, it's pretty close. You would have to really get it under a microscope to really tell that it wasn't factory. Uh, unless you leave all the, the, the flux on there. <laughs> uh, and the worst thing is, is a friend of mine had some, uh, uh, pace, pace flux. I don't know where he bought it. It was like at Goodwill or something. Uh, but, you know, once he put that on there and it got heated up and it was like he needed a chisel to get it off. <laughs> yes, sir. How do you deal with epoxy blobs? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, so epoxy blob. So, uh, we were looking at the, uh, Cujo. Uh, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the Cujo, it's like a firewall. So I cut the Cujo open, uh, and it had uh, all these test pins that had epoxy blobs across it. And I went online, and this one guy was like using a grinder, and another one was using a milling machine. I took a hot air reflow, heated it up till it slightly discolored, let it cool, and flicked it right off. So uh, it's a matter of just trying a lot of different methods. Uh, the worst one I ran into dealing with epoxy, we were doing an engagement and we were, I said we had a chip, we wanted to get it out of circuit just to make sure that was out of the picture, get the processor mounted up separately, powered up, feed it everything, see if we can get data off of it because we were having problems in circuit. Um, and I, I unsoldered all the leads and it wouldn't come. It was literally epoxy to the board. So there's a picture of me with a chisel knocking this chip off the board. We got it off the board and there was a big blob of epoxy where they glued it to the board. Yes, sir. Um, you've alluded a couple of times to you know, companies not patching security flaws that you found. In, the, in light of you know, things like the dying attacks and you know, homes getting the internet and the internet and stuff like that, how do you feel the companies are responding back to securing their devices with appropriate levels of security? I think uh, 95 plus percent of the companies I've dealt with are very proactive. Uh, we contact them, we give them the information. Um, we, we typically don't disclose until 60 days. If a company has and can't get it done in time and they reach out to us, obviously our, our job's about security, not insecurity. But most of them are really quick at fixing things. One of the companies um, that I complained about their Zigbee home automation protocol, which everyone knows is totally flawed. Um, they set up a conference call and I sat down with a number of their engineers and we just walked through every one of the vulnerabilities and they're like, you do know we can't fix that because it's this, you know, it's an open standard that hasn't been fixed and needs to be fixed by the standard organization. We're like, yeah, you're right. You're right. Let's go back and fix the blog post. And we added that to the blog post to correct it, uh, for their sake. But yeah, all these companies are very involved, uh, very proactive and very recipient to most of the issues. Um, and with only a few small cases, uh, where, where they don't, uh, a lot of times they say, Hey, we'll fix it. And then they fix it without telling us. Um, and then some of the communication doesn't get done, and then we publish it. And usually within a few hours of us publishing, they come back and go, oh, yeah, we fixed that. We forgot to tell you, and then we update the blog. But uh, but it's pretty rare for things not to get fixed, in my opinion. At least the things that are important. Obviously, we report some things to them that, you know, it's, it's subjective. And I'm fine with that. They're not like horrible critical errors, but it may be, you know, some other issues uh, around it that we're not aware of. And we have those discussions with those vendors and we, you know, express to them why we think this may or may not be a risk. Uh, and then they move from there. But yeah, they're usually pretty good. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it.